Lovers swear by me. Wars are fought over me. I am about the best cleaner of water that there is. Who am I? Chef Safield is up next. It is easy to understand why Greg Atkinson is so thoroughly in love with this place, with the water, the mountains, the trees. Greg Atkinson, chef and writer, award winner in both categories, he and the Pacific Northwest belong together. The Puget Sound, wedged between two grand mountain ranges. The clear waters flowing from the Cascade and Olympic Mountains, home to an abundance of shellfish, especially oysters. Chef Greg brought the seasonal tastes of the Northwest to life at Canlis, the celebrated Seattle restaurant. Now, in his other life, he is devoted to a school in the woods on nearby Bainbridge Island. Islandwood, a nonprofit educational experiment, brings city children out among the greenery into the sunshine, where it teaches sustainable growing, connection to the land, and the taste of good food right from the rich earth just a short ferry trip from Seattle. Coming to Islandwood for me was sort of a fruition and a completion of the work I had been doing at Canlis. It's not so much about the food as about what the food means. And so it brought me into kind of this opportunity to really instill those values about food into the minds of some very young people, a new group of young kids every week. Chef Atkinson's own books have recipes, sure. But it's the food essays, the journalism, and the graceful writings connecting food and place that win critical attention. What gets his attention on paper and in the kitchen? The mighty oyster. One thing I love about oysters, aside from how they look and taste and um, just make me feel, they're, each oyster is kind of like a little world in itself. The box, but I think you get into a kitchen and you got so many things to manage. Here is Greg with Bill Taylor, whose great-grandfather lifted oysters out of this same bay in 1880. Over a century and a quarter, the family has built a business not just on shellfish, but on cleanliness, sustainability, keeping land and water free of pollution. Bill Taylor's family cultivates oysters and, more important, the algae they eat. Greg, this is our start room for our algae here. Oh, um, right. So the inner sanctum. The inner Here's sanctum, the yes. These, uh, these algaes are, um, they're natural al algaes, and they're a variety of different uh, species here. You nice see colors. You see this dark green and a, right. almost a magenta, and then different browns. The different algae supply different nutritional needs that you'll find at the different larval stages. And so when growing, I think there's probably about 10 to 12 different species of algaes in here. These are all plants. Yes, these are these are so actually very small. Phytoplankton. Phytoplankton. They're very, very small, several cells chained together. Very cool. Algae, the backbone of the food chain. Microscopic marine photosynthesizers, one of the oldest creatures of the universe. The basic nutrition of virtually all sea animals. So each of the different colors provides a different nutrient? Right, they have different nutrients that are essential at different stages, stages for the larval development. Some of them are very, very small algaes that the larvae can eat, and some are larger algaes, but they've got a different nutrient component. So this one that's pale pink will eventually become such a dense colony that it'll be Absolutely. dark red it'll like, look that. like that. Right. And the light green will turn into turn, dark green. That's, that's correct. As, they're growing and getting more dense, more cells in there. And from uh, this, oh, you'll move it into a big tank so you can right. get a whole bunch of it? We'll move those into the tanks that we saw out in the uh, main algae room. So you're really like an algae farmer. We're really an algae farm. That's the primary thing that algae we farm. do here. One oyster might produce 500 million eggs. That's right, 500 million. You need a lot of food to feed that many critters. On to the broodstock, the best of the bunch oyster parents to be. It's not all algae. You are growing oysters here too, right? Right. This is actually our broodstock room here. And this is some of our broodstock here. These are some uh, oh, yeah, oysters, that's the, uh, Virginica oysters. Virginica. We'll bring some of the algae over here to feed these parents, basically. 
and they are fattened up and warmed up until they're ready to reproduce and then they'll, they're spawned and we'll take and put the uh, larvae from that spawn then into the large tanks in the larvae room. So um, you're going to prompt this thing to, to spawn by warming it up and feeding it. Right. The water in here is 70, 75 degrees. We'll basically simulate the conditions that are required to uh, make them spawn in so the natural environment. 70, 70, it's kind of like a Hawaiian vacation form, a little right. aloha <laughs> land there. That's right. Extra food, extra warmth, a yep. little swim. Why don't they spawn right in the bay where they're going to live? They actually will spawn in the bay, but they only do it in very short periods of time in the uh, summertime. So you're trying to create like this eternal summer thing for that's, these guys in here. That's right. And have you managed to create those same conditions for human beings so that we're like always ready? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if we can or do the that. oyster's but... part of that. <laughs> for oyster, yeah, oysters are definitely part of that, I hope. <laughs> okay, good. The offspring develop in the safety of the tanks for several weeks until they are hearty enough to brave the bay. So as soon as those oysters got big enough to leave the hatchery, they came here. That's right. These bins or boxes are all full of oysters. They have a screen on the bottom and the paddle wheel behind us here sucks water up through a channel and up through these bins and the water exits a outlet in the top of the box and the oysters feed on the algae that's being sucked up through them. We'll just take a look at some that just came here. And so some... they stayed at the hatchery for two or three months two or three before months. they came here. Whoa, it's like uh, panning for gold. Right. <laughs> Those are beautiful. So it grows probably a hundred times or, or more in the two to three months that they're here. So these will grow a hundred times larger. R right, before wow. they're put onto the beach. In here is the uh, larger seed. This will be going out. Oh wow, way larger. Going out on the beach here. So these guys are basically off to college. This is the end of the road for them here. And um, let's, why don't we go ahead and uh, take off here and let's go, let's go see where they uh, grow on the beach. I'm all for it, let's go shuck some. The tiny oysters are now off to their new home along the coast, to the muddy beaches that are so comforting to the bivalve. Throughout the Pacific Northwest, wealth trickles down the hillsides to the rivers, the bays, the sound wealth in minerals, nutrients. So this is where they grow up. Yeah, this is Totten Inlet. It's down in the south part of uh, Puget Sound. And this has been historically a very rich oystering area. Now these look like Pacifics, Let's like see. the ones we saw in there. Yeah, these are actually, right there. I think these are Kumamoto's. Oh, is that Kumamoto's? Let's open a bag here. Here's a Taylor creation, an oyster bag made of recycled materials to protect young growing oysters from predators. Now tell me about the predators. Who, who have you got? Besides, I mean, well, the crabs are one major predator. Another predator that more people are familiar with is a starfish. Oh, it looks like you got some uh, volunteer mussels on there. Yeah, there's, there's all mussels kinds of... Mussels and barnacles. Right. So it's clearly shellfish heaven. These are some Kumamoto's here. They're, Looks like they're about ready to be harvested. And these are my favorite, just like raw on the beach kind. Well, next to maybe that native Olympia. The, so you got that little abductor muscle cut. Yep. And it's ready to go. Mmm. You can taste the seawater, but there's also that sweetness of the, the glycogen in them. Right. The, the meat. Yeah, the... the it's awesome. It's a sweet oyster. This is... Um, I always say this is a good beginner oyster yeah. for anybody that's not used to raw oysters because it's sweet and it's relatively small, easier to eat maybe than the regular Pacific. They've become very popular here. These have a lot of juice in them. This is what I call the meroir. You know, you have your terroir in wines uh -huh. <laughs> and then the huh. meroir in the oyster. You can actually taste the sea that they grew in. Right. When you hear the name of an oyster, you know where it comes from. The Kumamoto's come from Japan. So this one is a Kumamoto, but then this one over here is much larger. Right. And it looks like it's bursting right out of the bag. Right. This looks like a big Pacific. That's, that's a pretty good sized Pacific. And, um, and this is one I'd want to put on the barbecue. Right. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, they're probably bigger than what most people want to eat raw. Better cooked. Right. This is like for my mom's oyster gumbo. Uh-huh. We're actually seeing quite a growth in the barbecue market. 
Are you? Um, for larger size oysters. And well, they're so good. They're pretty easy. I, you just throw them on the grill and uh, they pop open. You don't have to try to open them like what we're t attempting to do here. Yeah, I think people don't realize how meaty they are when they're cooked either. But this has really got a strong hinge. There we go. It's a nice, nice fat. Oh yeah, meat. well you did a great job. The oyster is nature's hearty little pump, the bivalve. This is the part that makes it kind of hard to open, right? That's, that's right, this is the abductor muscle. It uh, goes from the top shell through to the bottom shell, and it's a very strong, strong muscle. It's essentially the same muscle as what you'll see in a scallop. It's stronger than me. I can't, get it. <laughs> I can't open it on this one. This is the gills of the uh, oh, yeah. oyster here. They use this to feed, they pump the water, and through it, the algae, like what we saw in the hatchery today, gets filtered by the This by area the oyster. is the gills. Gills, right. Pulls water in, filters and ingests nutrients, and in the process is doing some cleaning. Millions of oysters pumping and squishing can clean and filter an entire bay. Oh, that's its stomach you must it's have opened, yeah. yeah and, and you can see the dark color that's strained out the different algaes, and you'll see different colors of stomachs through the year depending on what they're eating. It's really quite unlike anything else. And you know, it's almost like there's a melony quality. Mm -hmm. You know, something mm -hmm. really fresh and green, like that smell of just mown lawn. Right. Here's the family. Virginica, that imported Easterner. The Kumamoto, fluted, deeply cupped. Only slightly larger than her sister, the Olympia, the only one native to these waters, hardly bigger than a 50 cent piece. The Pacific, savior of an industry, brought from Japan 80 years ago, when over-harvesting and pulp mill pollution had wrecked oystering here. The Pacific, hearty as it is, literally brought oystering back to life in these waters. Do you have some more down the beach here? Yeah, we the... do. We'll just keep walking you're, along You're here. making me hungry again. Okay. Well, you know, another thing about this beautiful weather, they always used to say only eat oysters in months that have an R in the name, you know? Right is that um, some oysters are better in the winter than in the summer, right? That's right. Yeah. And what do you think of that whole tradition of oysters and... The aphrodisiac qualities? Yeah, yeah I, I think it's a... Um, I think that there's probably more than just a myth there. Oysters are high in zinc, and apparently zinc is important in uh, human reproductive processes. Yeah, I think it's no coincidence that Venus is often portrayed on the half shell. Right, <laughs> Coming right. out of a shell. It has inspired songs and poems and at least one little war. The oyster has built towns and fortunes and has a reputation as an aphrodisiac. Well, how long have these been on the beach? Uh, these oysters here are probably 18 months to two years old is what I'm guessing. You feel that little pop. Right. Yeah, when I they sneak in there and cut that abductor muscle. Oh yeah, that's a pretty oyster. Yeah probably about a medium-sized oyster. So this thing is just bursting with life. Yeah, let's and give it a shot. Hmm. There's a whole lot going on there. Yeah, the taste is a lot, uh, just much more complex when they get to be uh, a little older oyster like that. Oh, it's amazing. They got salty and sweet, and meaty. For more than 2,000 years, humans have been fetching, opening, and devouring oysters. I keep hearing those hammers, it's like the buildings are just coming in, encroaching on your territory here. This area must have changed a lot since yeah, you first started farming oysters. It's, it's developed uh, dramatically, particularly in the last 20 years or so. At one time it was just all old growth or uh, second, second growth, growth t least. timber along here. It's changed quite a bit. I noticed there's some really green lawns up there. <laughs> I wonder about the nitrogen and the fertilizer and... Well, that's, that's a, a, a very large concern and actually one of the biggest concerns we have for the future here in Puget Sound. We've seen what's happened in, in Chesapeake Bay and other parts of the country and you get this nutrient pollution. What happens is too much in here, you, your dissolved oxygens get in very low levels and then you'll have a lot of fish kills. You have a lot of different problems. Back east and across the globe, the human population explosion has spelled ruin for the oyster. Farm and suburban runoff spoiled the chemistry of the water. Overharvesting and disease added to the catastrophe. Not here. You know, we always hear that, you know, salmon farming gets a bad rap with 
probably some pretty good reasons the way you know it's fed wild fish and everything but it seems different with oysters it's kind of sea farming that makes sense it is i mean we don't we don't feed anything they just they filter the algaes out of the water that were that are there we're we've been here for a hundred years or so so we're definitely sustainable we keep we return to the same beds all the time grow new crops all the time the perfect accompaniment to the oyster, says Chef Greg Atkinson, is the earthy and abundant nettle. Yep, wild and obnoxious, and with that painful sting, growing in abundance among the forests of the Pacific Northwest. He finds Debbie Brainerd of Islandwood, a school in the woods, a place to connect with nature. Squash it between oh, there's just tons of nettles around here. No shortage is there. This looks like a good one. Merely brush against the tiny hair of the nettle and your skin will break off the end of what is a hollow tube, exposing a sharp point. This is too small to see. You will then be jabbed with the venom of the nettle. So I can't believe you're brave enough to touch these with your bare hands. Yeah, well the interesting thing is there aren't any of those hairs on the top that have folic acid in them. In fact, okay, if I'm you gonna just risk it. fold the leaf under and pick it so you don't touch the underside then you won't touch any of those little hairs that are so famous for stinging you. Right, I didn't realize that the, the kind of fuzz on top doesn't have it. Yeah. It's really and just the spiky ones on the bottom. So I you, think raw they sting and cooked they don't. No. So you just keep folding. Keep folding, and then what you wanna do is just, squ you can squish it in your hands and you can use the end of your nails Amazing. to do that. And then at a certain point, you'll start to see a lot of juice. Okay. From the leaf. And my fingers aren't stinging, so. Yeah, isn't that I'm right? I'm starting to believe you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and the best part's yet to come. You get to try your sample. So you're here. really going for it there, really. So see how nice and juicy that is? Yeah. So once it gets juicy, then it's actually edible, and the folic acid is no longer active. Okay. And you can eat this raw. It's actually. just the oxidation is breaking down it because I know it's a very fragile chemical, mm -hmm. the sting, and all that juice. It's really wonderful, isn't it? My first raw nettle mm -hmm. after all these years. It tastes good. It's got a very green kind of fresh spring taste. A little bit like. But it's almost a little harsh too. You can taste that it's related to mint. It kind of tricks your mouth into thinking there's something else going on there. There probably is something else going on there. <laughs> Some kind of chemical process. Yeah. So, Greg, who ever thought to eat these things? Gosh, I don't know. It makes me think like clan of the cave bear kind of thing. You know, there must have been some point when someone was hungry and they had to try everything. It's funny because there's that famous quote, it was a brave man that first ate an oyster, but I think it was a brave woman that first cooked a nettle. <laughs> yeah. Maybe I should borrow one of your gloves to just get sure. the tops of these. You know, you can use them any way that you would use spinach. So I think you said you have a friend who puts them in eggs. Right. So they make a great quiche or a great frittata. Uh, I think I have just about enough. Well, maybe we point. should um, head back to the dining hall. Yeah, and, uh, let's go turn them into sauce. Okay. Well, this dish is uh, a fried oyster served with a sauce of nettles. It's almost like a nettle soup, but it starts with leeks. And these are leeks from the garden here at Islandwood. And I'm just gonna slice these up, include all the white part and some of the green, but I won't get up into the tough parts. So a little bit of leek sauteed in a combination of butter, and olive oil. I want to soften the leeks, but I don't want to brown them. If they start to brown, they'll take on some uh, bitterness. Add some rice. This rice will actually become the thickener for the sauce. Any rice would do, whatever rice you have in the cabinet. Then we have those nettles that we gathered. You have to be careful to remind yourself not to grab them with your bare hands. No time to carefully fold each leaf here. I'm just gonna throw in a nice big handful. I really want the flavor of nettles to dominate in this sauce. 
cooking destroys that chemical that causes nettles to uh, sting. So, uh, nettle, where is thy sting? Just a little uh, time exposed to intense heat and that sting is gone. And then we're going to simmer it gently covered in this chicken broth for about 20 minutes or just until the rice is tender. So while the nettles are cooking, I'm going to fry some oysters. So I've got about an inch deep layer of canola oil. I want it hot to where it's just beginning to smoke, but not so hot that it's burning. For this dish, I'm going to use some of those virginica oysters that I've just shucked. To form a light breading on the fried oysters, I'm just going to combine some Washington grown organic white flour with some baking powder, freshly ground black pepper, and maybe a pinch of this sea salt. And the oysters are sitting in their own liquor. That's the water that came out of the shell when I shucked them. Toss them in that flour, and the combination of the oyster liquor and the flour forms almost a batter-like coating next to the oyster. And as more flour goes on, it becomes layered and dry enough to handle. And now I'll test the oil with a little smidge of that batter that formed on my finger. That batter floats immediately in bubbles. So I'm pretty confident that oil's about the right temperature. And I'll drop these oysters in. Give them one turn. Looking for a kind of a golden brown color that will let me know that the oyster is cooked through and the coating is crisp. I think they're just about there. What could be simpler? Nice fried oysters. I think the nettles should be tender by now. And I think this is ready to puree. It's best to blend this in small batches so that it doesn't come up out of the blender. This is going to be a little noisy. It's going to puree until everything's perfectly smooth. Looking for a uniform green color. So we've got a nice spring green sauce there, almost a soup. You really get a sense of uh, forest in the springtime there. So I'm going to put about three of these fried oysters right on top of that sauce. And that is ready to serve. So this is a puree of nettles with fried oysters on top. Every time we come to the table, we come back together. It's a way of connecting with the world and feeling like you're a, a part of something bigger. And food is that connecting link.